These are the steps. I will speak about definition of issues related to how to define the object of our talk today. And then I will ask myself, is it something new or not? Um, then um, we will get to the core of the thing, looking at the drivers of science diplomacy. And I could finish by uh, speaking about the actors of science diplomacy. This is a selection of topics. Uh, I mean that we could add other topics, but, uh, you know, I wanted to be uh, r rather uh, synthetical and not to um, put confusion in your minds. Uh, on the contrary, I would like to make things clearer. Um, starting from the very basics, diplomacy. Diplomacy, you know that, of course. Dialogue, negotiation as a method for managing international relations, relations between states. But also, and that, that's important for what will follow, uh, diplomacy is also um, the way of promoting a country's national interests on the world scene. So uh, keep this in mind. Uh, we'll turn to that later on. Diplomacy. Then science. What is science? I like the definition, very classical definition of the sociologist Robert Merton in the 1940s. Science is a sum of three different things. Scientific methods, the so-called scientific approach to understand facts, nature, or social facts. Scientific methods, then the result of this Investigations, knowledge, new knowledge, scientific knowledge, and also the value, values, the conduct, the behaviors of the scientists. And science, he said, Robert Merton said, science is uh, all this all together. Um, science, uh, in, in, in my talk today, uh, I do not make a distinction between uh, hard sciences and humanities or social sciences. All fields of scientific knowledge are included in what I will uh, call here science diplomacy. And also, when you understand science, you should understand as well technology. That's a discussion, you see, among specialists on the of science studies, but um, science means, and in, in the discourse about science diplomacy, science means science and technology. So uh, when you have this um, wording or expression, science diplomacy, you should understand science and technology diplomacy. Um, uh, innovation is something different, and uh, I, I won't speak about innovation here. I know that this is really a part of this uh, program, next week, and one of the very tricky questions uh, I have, I don't have the answer, but we could discuss th this further, uh, is the relationship between innovation diplomacy and science diplomacy, you see, which uh, brings back to the relationship between innovation and science. So um, this is, you, as you can see, a very slow beginning. Um, the values of science, of science are important here uh, they were recalled this morning by one of the uh, speakers, you see, the values of science. Um, we know the values of science, universality, rationality, transparency, disinterest of scientists. And I recall those values, which were uh, highlighted by Robert Merton and many others, of course, uh, in the discourse about science. I recall them because they are uh, a part of the science diplomacy approach. Why? Diplomats are interested in science diplomacy at the beginning because of the positive values, the, I would say even the beautiful values of science. Universality, rationality, transparency, disinterest. That's what we call uh, this morning. Um, 
This is a universal language. Sounds is said to be a universal language across boundaries, across cultures. People can understand each other. I mean, community of scientists, regardless of their national origin, they can understand each other uh, well. Um, so that's interesting for diplomats. If we understand that diplomats are people in charge of getting closer people of different countries, uh, finding bridges to uh, mutual understanding and so on. Uh, look at this, for instance. Uh, I don't know if it's quite readable here. Um, this, this is um, a, a survey which was made uh, by uh, Ipsos. Well, they do it every year. That this is the one of uh, two years ago. Um, this was done in Great Britain. They surveyed about 1,000 people. And the question is, uh, what are the professions that you trust most? And you see on the top that 90% of people that answer this uh, survey, they, they said, well, nurses and doctors, we trust them a lot. And then teachers, professors, scientists, all of them more than 80%. So people um, dealing with science are supposed to, to be or seen as reliable and trustable people, which is not the case at the bottom of politicians. <laughs> this is not a surprise, but journalists as well, you see. Uh, even professional footballers, government ministers. Well, I won't comment the bottom of this um, chart, but on the top. So this is the reason why science is something interesting for a diplomat as such, which have the purpose, you know, of negotiating, of finding ways, finding mutual understanding among countries, among cultures. Um, if I turn back to this, um, at a glance, in a few words, in a nutshell, sounds diplomacy, of course, this is the intersection of foreign affairs and scientific issues. That's simple, that's simple, of course. So, um, speaking about science diplomacy, we are in the field of um, international relations, geopolitics, and in the field of science, scientific cooperation, for instance. And secondly, science diplomacy is the field where there is some kind of uh, shared interest of scientists and of diplomats. In some fields or in some situations, they have the same interest. They can share the same interest. There are many situations where they do not share the same interest. You see, the values of the scientist, the independence of a scientist, for instance, sometimes would uh, lead him or her to, to keep away from diplomacy from geopolitics. But there are situations, of course, where such interests get close and this is the place where we are in science diplomacy. Now I turn to uh, the presentation of something which is very well known to all those who already have some culture about science diplomacy. Because in some sense, this is the starting point of, the, um, of today's reflection on science diplomacy. Um, I will criticize eyes a little bit later on, but what is it? You see this uh, cover, this is a cover of a report which was uh, published in 2010 by the uh, Royal Society and by uh, the American Association for the Advancements of Science. The year before, in 2009, they organized in London a meeting, about 200 people, scientists, diplomats, journalists as well, some politicians, uh, in order to uh, reflect on 
the idea of science diplomacy. And the report is, uh, has a title which is interesting, New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy, and the subtitle, uh, which you, you cannot read, maybe from, from your seat, Navigating the Changing Balance of Power. This is important, why? Because maybe before 2010, maybe, you could find, scarcely in the literature or in the comments, people speaking about science diplomacy. It was rare, it was a rare situation. But since then, since this report was issued, the wording, the vocabulary of science diplomacy has disseminated. So in some, the, the, the discourse of science diplomacy started from this report, nine years ago. And more precisely, what did they say, which is still um, to, uh, to be considered today? This report said three things. <laughs> said science diplomacy has three expressions, three forms of expression. The first is science in diplomacy, informing foreign policy with scientific advice. When diplomats negotiate at the international level on topics which have uh, a scientific content, environment, health, international security, many others, they need to be informed, they need to uh, understand a minimum of the scientific um, knowledge on such topics. So uh, science in diplomacy this is the first um, way by which scientists and diplomats meet and talk to each other. Science is an input of international negotiation. Science is necessary to, be, to fuel the, the diplomatic um, negotiations on many topics. First thing, science in diplomacy. Then, second expression of science diplomacy. Diplomacy for science. This is all uh, what is related to uh, the ways by which diplomats help scientists, support them for international cooperation. As you recall, I work at French embassies some years ago, and part of my job was to, to you know, to, to bring um, instruments in support of cooperation between France and the scientific community uh, of the country I was working in at that time. So this is diplomacy for science. Diplomats help scientists to um, interact. They do not need diplomats, of course. Uh, as, um, in the absolute terms, the, the community of scientists has found ways to uh, interact at the international level for centuries, you see. But if diplomats are there, there is an added value, there is something more that makes more uh, effective the relationship, the scientific relationship between home scientists and scientists uh, of abroad. Diplomacy uh, for science. And then, Third, science for diplomacy. Science for diplomacy, which is maybe the, the most um, original or difficult uh, aspect of, of uh, the, the science diplomacy as presented by this report. Science for diplomacy uh, refers to uh, situations where scientific cooperation between countries can help diplomatic relationships, can help political relationships, and especially in situations where countries are not uh, so, uh, so friends to each other, you see. Scientific cooperation uh, may have something, may uh, help to find bridges between countries, whereas um, the political dialogue has turned to be difficult. So this is science for diplomacy. You know, uh, diplomacy for science, we could say diplomats help uh, scientists, who can help scientists, 
at the international level. And science for diplomacy is the reverse movement. Scientists can bring something which is helpful for the diplomatic agendas of uh, countries. Um, I will illustrate this. Uh, first illustration. This is an illustration of science in diplomacy. Um, you have heard, of course, of, of the uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is what is called a science policy interface. Uh, a panel of experts uh, writing reports, bringing um, a written version of knowledge about climate, the evolution of climate, the past of the climate, the present of the climate, and the possible the future of the of the climate, which is, uh, of course, um, a, a, a top-level um, issue. So this um, slide refers to a meeting who took place in uh, Stockholm in 2013. The year after 2014, the IPCC uh, issued its uh, fifth uh, annual report. The IPCC was founded in uh, 1988. Uh, under the patronage of uh, the, uh, na the United Nations and the World Meteorological uh, Organization. And since then, every five years, they issue a very comprehensive report on, on climate and on climate change. And this report has three parts, and the first part of the report is the scientific basis. What do uh, specialists of climate have to say about the climate and its past and present and future. So in this meeting, um, this science basis of climate change report was adopted. What is interesting is that in this meeting, almost 200 people were present, representatives of governments, but also representatives of the scientific community who contributed to the report. And one special point is that uh, they write a summer, an, an executive summary of the report. The report is 400 to 500 pages, you see. Not many people read all this. But everybody reads the, summer, the executive summary, 30 or 40 pages. And this executive summary is adopted line by line during this meeting. So you have a meeting with the government representatives, all those who, have, uh, who belong to the climate convention, 160, even more uh, countries, and um, representative of the scientific community who um, wrote the report. They vote line by line, not on science, but on the way the expression of science is made in the report. So this is a way by which scientists and diplomats interact. Science in diplomacy, as I explained, science in diplomacy is how science can fuel international negotiation. Well, this is an example of science in diplomacy. Uh, another thing, we are here um, in 1985. This is President Reagan. And this is Mikhail Gorbachev. At that time, he was uh, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR. And they met for the first time in Geneva. And Gorbachev came with an idea. He said to Reagan, look, uh, we can do something interesting in the field of um, scientific research. We can try to build a big infrastructure in order to verify if it is possible, if it is feasible from the process of nuclear fusion to uh, produce energy. Of course, Gorbachev well, is not a, was not, he's not a scientist. So he got the idea from his scientists around him. And he brought this idea to, uh, to, Gorb to, to Reagan, which was very symbolical. Because, you know, we were in, still in the uh, Cold War, of course, the detente. And up to now, up to this time, the nuclear energy was associated with um, weapons, with armaments. And he said, well, we can do something good for humanity, for the general interest. If, uh, if we move on 
in our knowledge of the process of nuclear fusion. So um, Reagan said, yes, we can discuss that. And that was the beginning of the uh, ITER project. ITER means International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. The year after, to Soviet Union and to uh, the US, the European Union, but also Japan, uh, decided to, uh, to join the project. And then after, India, China, and uh, South Korea also decided to, to join the project. The project is under construction in France. And what, why is it an example of diplomacy for science? This is an example because um, in order to achieve this very big project, an amount of money is necessary, $30 billion. Uh, ten years are still to go to finish this uh, construction in the south of France. Diplomats have uh, had to negotiate between them to find the money to decide about the governance, to decide in which country this um, infrastructure would be uh, set. So this is an example of diplomacy uh, for science. And um, last example to illustrate the last point, science for diplomacy, this is uh, President Obama, um, a picture which was taken during uh, the Cairo speech. The Cairo speech is a landmark in the history of science diplomacy. What happened? Eight years after the 201 event in, 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 uh, in New York and the United States, um, he was elected the year before, as you know, Obama, and he wanted to reset the inter international uh, relations with um, Arab and Muslim countries. So he came to, to Cairo, made a speech in a university there, talking about different things, a very open speech. Um, he very smartly recalled that his second name was uh, his Hussein, which is an Arabic name. So, that, you know, he was in sort of attitude of uh, holding his hand to such countries. And in his uh, discourse, in his talk, he, um, speech, he um, announced that he would uh, take initiatives in order to uh, favor the creation of research centers in Middle East countries and Southeast uh, of Asia countries as well. And uh, also that he would send envoys science and voice to those countries in order to uh, discuss with the communities of such countries of the possibilities of scientific cooperation. This was the launching of a science and voice program. And um, so he did that. And since then, since uh, uh, 2009, about 20, Top levels, uh, American scientists have been sent, have been missioned to um, countries in the Arabic world or Muslim countries uh, in order to discuss. Uh, President Trump didn't, didn't skip, didn't push away this program. That means something. So this is an example of uh, science for diplomacy. Why? Because such scientists, you know, top level scientists, already have connection at the international level. They do not need for them or for, for their research. They do not need to get more connections. Um, but they decided to agree and to participate in what we can call the political agenda. The political agenda of President Obama was to get closer to uh, a certain category of countries and to show them that the United States can speak something different from the language of weapons, of bombing and things like that. So putting science forward, recalling the positive values of science, universality, common language, and so, was something clever, of course. And uh, this is an example of science uh, for diplomacy. Now I would like to, to go deeper in the concept, to try to, to um, enrich 
our understanding of this. Let me say a couple of words about what I call a translation difficulty. A translation difficulty. As you have noticed, English is not my native language. And uh, uh, in my native language, people who speak or are interested with science diplomacy say diplomacy scientifique. In Spain, Marga, in Spain, uh, diplomatia scientifica, which is not very different in Italian or in Portuguese. In Russian, naučnaya diplomacia. And other languages, maybe. You can help me from your own native language to, uh, well, what I want to show is this. If I come from my native language, diplomacy scientifique, or from the Spanish, or from the Russian, I check also for the Czech language. If I put this in the tr software for translating this, what comes out? What comes out? Every time, scientific diplomacy. You see? Scientific diplomacy. Not science diplomacy. So, there's something to, to understand from that. I'm not sure I fully understand this because this is a linguistic problem, but what I would say is this. You see, uh, in French, diplomacy scientifique, you have a noun and an adjective. The same in Spanish, the same in Portuguese, the same in Italian, the same in Russian. Noun, adjective. If you have together a noun and an adjective, this is not the same as having two nouns, sounds and diplomacy. Um, first situation, scientific diplomacy, adjective noun. It seems to me that this directs the reflection, the thinking, to this point. Well, scientific diplomacy is a subset of diplomacy that we have cultural diplomacy, for instance, we have scientific diplomacy. So this is a subset, a sectoral approach you know, in the toolbox of a diplomat, you, know, you will have scientific diplomacy. So this is a subset, saying scientific diplomacy is a subset of diplomacy and directs the reflection towards what I call an instrumental use of science. As a diplomat, I can use science for my diplomatic goals as well as I can use culture, for instance, for my diploma. So this is scientific diplomacy. And we are really in the realm of public policy. Scientific diplomacy is a public policy, uh, among other public policies. Whereas, if you say science diplomacy, don't putting together one noun and another noun, well, the idea is both those words should be taken equally. You see, one noun, one noun. When you have an adjective, of course, everybody knows that the adjective is not as strong as the name. The name is the thing the most important. And then the adjective puts a coloration to the name. But science diplomacy, well, gives the idea, gives the idea that you, have, you balance, you see, science, and you balance this with diplomacy. And actually, this is the discourse which comes from the definition of uh, Royal Society AAAS, interactions between two worlds, the world of science, the world of diplomacy. So interaction between two worlds, and when you read more about this, well, you have interesting things to say about science diplomacy as a co-construction, which is a reality, a, a set of behaviors which are co-constructed by scientists and by diplomats. The word nexus is also used for that. Now turning back to those countries which in their own language speak about scientific diplomacy. This is a problem. For instance, in my country, people speak about uh, diplomacy scientifique. What is the problem? And for instance, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in my country considers 
and he's right. That's proper, it is right, it's a proper view. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs considers that diplomacy scientific is its own affair. This is the business of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the Ministry of Higher Education in my country, when you ask them, what about diplomacy scientific? The answer most frequently, well, this is not our business. Apply to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, so this is exactly the problem, you see. If you speak about diplomacy scientific or the equivalent adjective plus noun in other countries, you miss something which seems to me to be uh, the, the most original point of science diplomacy and not scientific diplomacy, which is the interactions, you see, between the two. So um, I don't know how to, uh, to change this. Uh, to, to probably science diplomacy is most, it's more clearer for English native speakers than for others, because when you translate it to other languages, as, as I showed here, you missed, you missed the uh, interactive aspect. You missed the co-construction aspect. This is one point which I, I leave to linguists to find solutions. Um, now, even if those two words, science and diplomacy, have to be taken equally, I would recommend to each of you to look first at the word diplomacy. Afterwards, coming after the, the word science. In science diplomacy, what is to be understood first is diplomacy. Why? Because if you look at diplomacy, at the word diplomacy and what it means, and what would I recall, uh, you bring in discussion the national interest. And you cannot escape this. Science diplomacy always have a national interest involved. Why? Because diplomacy is, you know, and re reflects the sovereignty of states. And I cannot imagine any diplomatic action without the national interest of the country being involved, being at stake. So if you look at diplomacy first, you have to keep in mind that the national interest is important. And we can enrich the definition of sound diplomacy in this way. Sound diplomacy refers to actions which either directly or indirectly advance the national interest. Which was not exactly at the core of the first, which I would call the historical, the standard, I can say also the mainstream definition of science diplomacy, the one of 2010. Um, something interesting happened uh, <coughs> recently, I mean, at the end of 2017, um, a paper was written by Gluckman and uh, other uh, authors proposing an alternative frame, proposing to reframe the presentation of the traditional historical presentation of science diplomacy. Uh, they said, well, that's interesting, you know, diplomacy for science, science for diplomacy, etc., etc. but we can have a look from another perspective. And this is the, al the alternative uh, framing. What is science diplomacy? They said, action designed to directly advance the country's national needs. This is the first, you know, um, objective. Then, action designed to address cross-border interests. For instance, countries having, you know, a, a, a river, having um, conflicts or having to manage um, natural resources which are, you know, at, at, at the border of each of, of, them, of them. Secondly, and thirdly, actions primarily designed to meet global needs and challenges. What is interesting in, in this alternative typology, what is interested, in, interesting to me is that the national interest is everywhere. National needs or national interests are both the same, cross-border interests of, of respective countries, and meet global needs and challenges while the nat whole national interests have to uh, combine themselves in order you know, to face uh, global challenges. So 
this Russian definition integrates the explicitly, explicitly uh, mentions the national interests of countries, which was not the situation 10 years ago. To me, this is a progress. To me, this is more realistic. I cannot imagine that any, once again, any diplomatic action, any dip diplomatic strategy would be made by a country without taking first into account its national interest. Of course, then trying to combine smoothly, as smooth as possible with other countries, but the national interest is there. So that's another way of getting deeper into the, the concept. Um, I would like to stress also the political dimension of science for diplomacy. I mentioned that turning back to the original uh, framing, science for diplomacy is maybe the most um, difficult or maybe the richer part of the discourse on science diplomacy. Um, there is an un underlying geopolitical project in science for diplomacy. The American scientists accepting to, be, to become uh, science and voice, they agree with you know, the political will of Obama to, uh, to restore relationships. So, um, and of course, this is a very respectable objective, of course. But you know, th this means that the scientific uh, behavior of the scientist comes with the, um, the po political um, expression as well. Using science for restoring developing links with certain countries means that there is a political agenda which is running, adding to the uh, scientific agenda. And you can see this um, also, this is interesting, uh, using science cooperation as a lever for regional integration policy. Um, I will take two, two examples. The European Union, first, um, you know that the, uh, the diplomacy of the European Union is weak. I mean, the political diplomacy is weak. You know that the European Union doesn't have any army. Just a fact, I'm just observing that. Can, I, I don't express any position, of course, on that. But, you know, as such, as an as, as, uh, as institutional body, the European Union has a weak diplomacy, has difficulty to uh, have its voice taken into account on the international scene. But at the same time, if you look at some uh, policies, European policies, some of them are very effective. And what is very effective in Europe is the research policy. The research policy is very effective. It has been used as a tool to make countries closer, the European research area, we could speak also of Erasmus uh, programs. And it has been a tool also to project the influence of Europe outside of Europe. If you look at the um, um, research frame, the programs um, framework, programs of the H2020 type, you know, those European research projects, they are open to non-member countries. They are open to non-member countries. Uh, the, uh, if you look at the uh, Marie Curie uh, fellowships, the Marie Curie fellowships so far in 10 years have benefited to uh, researchers from almost 90 different nationalities. Which means that Europe has been using the research policy to promote itself on the global scene, to be attractive, to promote the European model. And this is a political project, of course. Another illustration of this is uh, the BRICS, uh, the Association of Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. You know that. We are in Brazil. Um, if I'm not wrong, uh, in 2015, in Brasilia, this took place in this country, a memorandum of uh, understanding was signed between the Ministry of Higher Education and Research of those five countries. And they decided to stimulate the scientific cooperation between 
their countries, between the scientists of their countries. So they decided to do what Europe did uh, before, to use the research policy as a tool for more integration between them. So this is another illustration of the geopolitical project, which is to favor integration between those five countries, uh, relationship between this political project and the scientific activities of the countries of each uh, of uh, scientists of all these countries.